to uh, pay my respect to uh, the traditional owners of the land we're on and um, Aboriginal elders, um, past, present and, and emerging. Um, I'd also like to uh, welcome everybody to this, which must be uh, what the fifth or sixth uh, that we've run uh, during the COVID lockdown of the service providers conference. Um, it's been very important running these sessions to try and keep some cohesion with the sector, uh, try and uh, get the information out, uh, try and give people an opportunity to connect and remain as a sector. So we've been very committed to that and we appreciate people coming on during their very busy days. Uh, today's sessions on COVID and the consumer and there's a, a two, three se uh, sections to it. Um, we've got Elisa Buggy who will be uh, chairing the event today and uh, she, she's a social worker just like uh, myself um, from, but not from Tassie um, uh, where she uh, emanated from. Um, I've known Elisa now for a, a number of years and she's made a fantastic contribution to the Victorian scene through particularly the way in which she's been able to establish uh, the drug courts and the family drug court and provide a whole range of invite, advice and insight into how we can keep people out of the uh, correction system. Um, of course, there's many other parts to Liza's work, but I'll let her explain some of the more relevant aspects to it. I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Eliza. Thanks, Sam. That was much kinder an intro than um, I was anticipating. And I'm, I'm very much uh, um, appreciate that. And also very grateful, um, uh, sorry, and, and uh, very, yeah, grateful to be with you all today, sharing what is um, shaping up to be, as Sam said, a cast of thousands, but, um, but extro extremely important and insightful group of people to share their insights on the topic of um, COVID and the consumer today. Um, we have, as Sam mentioned, a couple of parts um, to the to the session, which will we're aiming to finish um, around 12, 12.30, 12 um, just to make sure that, uh, so we've got it listed until 12.30 to make sure that if there are burning questions uh, for any of the panelists as we go on, that we'll be able to answer them. Before I begin, I also want to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're all meeting across across Victoria and potentially other parts of the country. I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and also to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today and, and in particularly acknowledge their continuing sovereign own ownership um, in this NADOC week um, with the theme always, always was, always will be, which I think is a really, also a really pertinent um, uh, uh, and, and resonating theme um, throughout the, this particular topic for this webinar as well. So, um, as I said, we have two, uh, two, two and a half, three parts um, to, to the conversation today. And so I want to kick off really quickly so that I, so that you don't have to hear from me um, and get to hear much more from the amazing people that we've got joining us today. The first of whom is Editor Kennedy, who is the lead project and systemic advocacy worker at APSU. Um, so, and, and Editor's going to first off uh, do some presenting on, on the um, the survey of service users and COVID-19 that editor and her team and, and some and colleagues in the sector um, pulled together very early on, reacted very quickly at the start of this pandemic to, to um, pull together and gain some amazing insights. And editor is going to share some of those. Um, between the 21st of May and the 9th of June this year, the Association of Participating Service Users, that is APSU, interviewed 32 Victorians who'd, who had access to AOD treatment across seven different, sorry, not seven, not just seven, 17 different organisations since the COVID-19 restrictions were put in place. 
In this presentation, editor will talk about some main findings that came out of this consultation, how service users experienced the changes in service delivery, what were the main challenges from them during this period, and what are their expectations for, um, from the AOD services. And I think that last point is an extremely important one for all of us service providers to, um, to make sure that we continue to reflect on and be aware of. The presentation is going to be followed uh, by an expert panel discussion that Edit is going to lead. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over and put you all in the very, very safe hands of Editor Kennedy. Thank you, Elisa. Um, I also wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that uh, different lands that we are all coming from. I will be speaking to you from uh, the land of the Banurang uh, nation, uh, people of the Kulin nation. And um, I wish to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, so let me just start with the presentation. Um, Okay, so um, first, just in case that some of you don't know um, who APSU is and what we do, um, we are the Victorian Consumer Representative Body for people who use alcohol and drug treatment services, and we are a part of SHARC. Um, our vision is, um, Sorry, I have to move this around. Our vision is a supportive and inclusive democratic society where people impacted by drug dependency are treated with respect and dignity, free of stigma and discrimination, and where their needs, strengths, and expertise inform and drive the AOD service system policy and research. Our mission is to ensure that the voices, opinions, and experience of consumers are heard, respected, and integrated into service and policy development. So um, that's uh, considering our mission, it, it, it makes sense that uh, when the COVID-19 restrictions were introduced in March this year, um, we, our main concern was that the voices of people were, could not be heard given the circumstances and there was just, the emergency was uh, far too great for any voices really to, to, for any consultations to take place before uh, putting uh, the measures in place. So um, with that concern in mind, we decided to um, get some, uh, uh, to, get um, to talk to some people that uh, were using services at the time of restrictions. And we embarked on this uh, consultation. Um, the consultation was conducted between 21st of May and 9th of June. Um, we did 32, uh, we, we talked to 32 people who accessed services uh, since March this year. Uh, we conducted telephone interviews. They were in a conversational form, so they were quite um, relaxed and, and uh, people had opportunity to raise any, anything that they felt that uh, needed to be heard. Um, as Elisa said earlier, they, um, th these 32 people accessed uh, a variety of AOD uh, treatment programs across 17 publicly funded organizations. And um, the full report is available on our website. You are very welcome to have a look at it. Uh, it contains more information than what I will uh, be presenting today. Uh, given the um, time constraints, I have chosen to focus on three main areas today. Um, so I will be talking uh, first about experiences with uh, service delivery, changes in service delivery, particularly with remote service delivery, but also some other things. Um, the second topic is um, IT challenges, which is a major issue that came out of this uh, consultation. And finally, 
I will be talking about the role of AOD services as uh, people that we talk to perceive it and uh, what their expectations are. So, before I start with these topics, I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of um, the profile of these 32 people we talked to. Um, they, uh, we, we talked to 14 women and 18 men. Um, majority were in metropolitan area, uh, 26. The remaining six were from regional areas. Um, we had a fairly good age representation with the youngest person being 21 years old and the oldest 65 years old. The majority were in their 30s and 40s. Um, and um, just, uh, I just wanted to show you the housing situation. So, so it was a variety of uh, housing uh, settings. What, what is significant in this is that seven people were in residential treatment that will come up later in my presentation. Uh, but yeah, there were a number of people that were at different stages of homelessness, um, private rental, homeowners, public housing all sorts. So, so talking about service delivery, um, the remote service delivery wasn't really met with, with enthusiasm. Um, and I imagine this isn't a surprise to anyone, but um, uh, almost everyone, almost all of our respondents found it as a poor substitute for, for the real thing, for the face-to-face -face treatment. Um, this quote comes from um, an ICE user who was in earlier stages of accessing uh, AOD treatment. And uh, this person said that it hasn't really addressed what I need it hasn't really hit the mark. I can fly under the radar this way. There's plenty of room to hide. When it's face to face, there's no room to hide. As a result, my intake has actually gone up through the roof. So this is someone who has been, who was attending regularly um, remote sessions with, with the worker, with the counselor, but it really was not, was having the opposite effect, unfortunately. Um, so this issue of uh, the difficulty in developing, for especially I'm talking about people in earlier stages of uh, treatment, uh, people who were in later stages of treatment didn't have as much issue with this, uh, but those who were in earlier stages were uh, really finding uh, it difficult to develop a sense of trust and uh, to a sense of accountability towards their worker. Um, another big issue that I will talk about late, uh, later also is um, the difficulties with IT and uh, the online transition. And this was both in terms of uh, service users' access to equipment, internet, and uh, their skill level, uh, but also some services uh, struggled, especially in those first few weeks. Uh, it changed as, as time went on. Um, so the transition was a little bit patchy. Um, in some cases, it was seamless. Uh, in, in some other uh, services, struggled to, to get the online service delivery going. Um, there was obviously an increased sense of isolation. And the reason why this sits here, I mean, I know we all had an increased sense of isolation. It's not a, a unique experience to service users, but many service users um, rely on, on uh, their uh, journey to their service uh, for a social interaction. Um, so not having to do that journey, not having those interactions on the way, but, but having just um, that um, interaction that, uh, you know, on the phone or online um, and then turning the screen off 
um, didn't it, it was increasing this sense of isolation so it was it, it didn't give them opportunity to to have any interaction on the way um and so the next thing was um around pharmacotherapy supply um uh, we had nine people out of these 32 who were on the pharmacotherapy program and um they were very anxious that uh you know, with the general uncertainty that um, that that happened with COVID, um, they were very concerned that uh, pharmacotherapy supply would just cease. And uh, they, a few of them, asked for reassurance from their pharmacists. Obviously, no pharmacist could guarantee. Uh, pharmacists said, "I don't think that will happen." Uh, but sorry. Uh, but they couldn't guarantee that the supply would continue. So um, service users uh, that were on pharmacotherapy, few of them raised uh, this issue and, and thought that it would have been really reassuring uh, to receive some official message um, that uh, there would be no um, discontinue discontinuation of pharmacotherapy supply. Um, you know, this... Uh, this anxiety is really quite strong. People are really scared. They, they are aware of how sick they would feel if uh, they couldn't access their pharmacotherapy. Um, and the uh, final issue wa was the inability to access um, any support in kind. So quite a few people rely on vouchers or food parcels that they receive from services. And it helps their financial situation, obviously, not being able to access those was a bit of an issue for a few. So what did work well? Um, what was really appreciated was flexibility demonstrated by um, AOD workers and uh, services. Um, it um, e even with those uh, hiccups in the first two or three weeks, um, all all services have been flexible and have learned to to adapt and uh, to collaborate with their service users in making the service delivery as efficient as possible. Um, they were also vital in. Um, uh, managing clients' stress around other issues that came up. So we had a couple of uh, participants who had very stressful uh, situations with uh, the child protection services. In these cases, uh, AOD services were really um, played a vital role in, in uh, managing that situation and the uh, client's stress level. Um, and there were some other similar situations. Uh, what particularly worked well in this period with remote service delivery is um, when um, the frequency of contact uh, was increased um, to counter the inability to provide face-to-face -face treatment. So um, if someone was seeing their counselor once a week, uh, getting in touch with their counselor a couple of times a week really worked well, um, or more times. Uh, th th that was reassuring and that um, did hit the mark. Um, also, um, while off-site options and, and uh, you know, remote service delivery was not um, preferred by grand majority, there were Two, two people who did appreciate having these options. Uh, both of these participants were um, single parents and in uh, later stages of uh, treatment. So uh, they had a number of other duties and being able to access um, services uh, remotely was really helpful for them. So maybe it is an option that, that uh, you know, should be considered for some clients. 
Um, what worked particularly well and what was really important is peer support. And I, by this, I mean uh, both uh, peer support programs within the services, uh, the unfunded programs like uh, 12 sub fellowships, as well as uh, really any kind of group work was found really helpful where people could interact with their peers. Um, and this, these programs uh, provided particularly source of connection. Um, some useful strategies, it was really useful for people to be able to compare uh, their situation with the situation of other people that were in similar uh, circumstances and how they were dealing with everything. And it was also a source of information in, in uh, you know, we were all flooded by a lot of information and we were all confused by what is actually going on and, and uh, uh, for um, clients, uh, few, few of, a few participants reported that talking through some of information and finding out information from their peers was really helpful. Um, and um, finally, what worked was pharmacotherapy. So pharmacotherapy was the only um, service type that uh, saw an improvement in uh, consumers, in service users' experience. Um, and this was due particularly to um, the changes in policy. So, uh, being able to, um, so the increase in takeaway doses, which enabled people to, to visit pharmacy less frequently, obviously, and um, as well as telehealth options. Uh, so whereas uh, remote service delivery in uh, other treatment types didn't really, uh, uh, wasn't uh, really, didn't really hit the mark. In, in pharmacotherapy, it was, um, it received very positive feedback. Um, uh, all pharmacotherapy clients that uh, participated in our consultation uh, that had um, access telehealth were very happy with it and didn't feel that they missed out on anything. Okay, so the next uh, thing I want to talk about is uh, the IT issues uh, that uh, came up really strongly. So um, this is just to show you um, the uh, out of our 32 participants, 50%, uh, so 16 could only access internet through their mobile phones with limited data. Uh, one person had no internet, and um, the remaining 15 um, had Wi-Fi access. Now, these 15 include those seven people in residential services, who um, many of whom probably would not have Wi-Fi access had they not been at, in a residential service. Um, and this was quite a major issue. So it was an issue in terms of um, accessing services, but also, I mean, um, I, I'm sure if you all think uh, on last few months um, and what uh, you have been doing in your work life, in your personal life, internet played a huge role and not having it uh, would have made things very different for each of us. Um, so it, it is a huge element of exclusion and marginalization. Um, the issues were um, a lack of equipment. Um, a lot of people simply could not afford a computer uh, some people had old computers that, for example, didn't have a webcam. Uh, so participating in, in um, um, online groups were, was difficult um, or didn't have other equipment. Um, 
a lack of skills was also a major issue. So we, we had one participant who actually did have um, could access Wi-Fi and did even have a laptop, uh, who, which was donated to them by someone. Uh, but the laptop was just sitting there because they didn't know where to start with, with it. And um, um, so these issues played a huge role in people's experiences, both of services as well as general situation. Um, and this is definitely something that uh, needs to be considered and is a huge issue, not only for IOD services, really for any community services and just an issue of uh, inclusive versus exclusive society. Um, and finally, I would like to talk about the role of AOD services as perceived by uh, service users or by these 32 uh, people we talked to. Um, so what um, the, the key word is connection and um, the most people we talk to really saw alcohol and drug services as a source of social connection. Nine participants, uh, so almost 30% of participants, had no other support in their lives other than their AOD service. So the AOD service was a very, very important element in their life. Um, the remaining, you know, out of the remaining participants, uh, they also didn't have a very strong uh, support network. Uh, but um, there is, so there is a significant number of people that uh, rely exclusively on AOD services um, as not only support for their uh, drug issues, but also for uh, social connection. And um, many uh, have expressed the desire to engage in social activities within services um, the, uh, that are not uh, centered around treatment. So um, uh, activities that are social in nature uh, and some, some ex uh, examples like, um, you know, in this quote, uh, this person talked about uh, cooking or art activities. Um, one person was talking about uh, having sports activities and sports groups. Um, nature walks were brought up. So all kinds of different social activities uh, that are not strictly related to treatment. Um, uh, and that provide an opportunity to interact with peers um, in a drug-free environment. Um, so that that was a re really a uh, big element, and and I found that quite interesting. Another thing with in terms of connection is um, um, so uh, there was this sense that connection should be at the center of um, treatment. Um, this um, one, one participant uh, talked about old fashioned genuine connection as opposed to uh, sterile clinical settings um, as something that they need to, for, the, for treatment to work. So um, I know that uh, the sector became very professional, especially in the last decade. And, uh, you know, um, but, but uh, maybe there is, uh, and I'm not saying that uh, services are not doing this, but, but I'm just not sure how much uh, there is awareness of this. And um, um, this is what service users expect and want and uh, for them um, this is uh, AOD services really play that role of uh, providing social interaction. So 
Um, just um, to conclude, um, I can say that um, this consultation was very positive for AOD services. Uh, people we talked to uh, definitely um, had the sense that for them, AOD services were essential in their lives. Um, there was a really, so while there was some criticism of, of the system, uh, treatment system, etc., cetera, um, it, the criticism never extended to AOD workers. There was a really strong sense of camaraderie and appreciation and gratitude for the AOD workers. Um, in terms of uh, IT issues and digital divide, um, this is definitely something that needs to be uh, addressed. And I believe that, um, you know, a AOD treatment system, harm reduction, um, all of us really have a duty to advocate about this because it is a huge element of exclusion. And um, it was not created by COVID because for uh, the past two decades, our lives have transitioned more and more online. A lot of practical things we, we do more and more online, entertainment, socialization, um, everything is uh, much more online, but uh, there is a group of uh, really marginalized people who are excluded from this online space. And um, in situations like COVID, that really is strongly highlighted. Um, and finally, um, the word treatment does not seem to fully encompass the role of AOD services in service users' minds. Um, and maybe that is something we should rethink. So um, with that in mind, I would like to introduce our panel. I'll just stop sharing here. And um, I want to welcome um, Sione Crawford, uh, the CEO of Harm Reduction Victoria, who's joining us in panel today. Hi, Sione. Um, we have Beth Lucky from um, Access Health and Community, AOD manager. Hi, Beth. Hi. And uh, Mark Powell, um, the operations manager from the Western Region Auckland Drug Center in Warrnambool. Hi, Mark. Hey. And um, so look, I I'll kick off with, with the first question. Um, and the last point I talked about. So um, our respondents have indicated that for them, the role of AOD services goes beyond uh, treatment and particularly that it is an, an important source of social connection. So my questions to you are, how much are services aware of this role uh, of providing social connection? Should this role be formalized in some way? And um, what is the role of peer support programs in this? And um, maybe we can start with you, Beth. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, I can only really speak from my own experience, but I think um, certainly in the, the roles and actions that I've worked at, I think um, the role of that social connection for clients and people experiencing alcohol and drug issues is really um, well known in services. Um, and it was, it's unfortunate that it's, it's often been lost in the, in the work really. Um, you know, we have lots of data to report and lots of um, KPIs to meet and often the things that aren't fun, but the things that are most important to the person sitting in front of you. Um, that might be just having a chat, that might be not being really ready to, to go into that sort of formal treatment, but actually just having, sitting someone down, having a cup of tea, um, getting them a music or an apple, and um, just sort of seeing where things are at, you know, bringing in a peer support worker or, um, you know, another worker just to, to get this person sort of settled and, and calm and relaxed. Um, I think we've really lost that in the, in the phone sessions, even 
even actually just walking to the service or catching the tram to the service or, or driving to the service, people are starting to sort of um, start getting ready for talking about their substance use, putting their recovery or their treatment goals, whatever it is that they want to call them, putting them on the agenda for the day. Um, you know, when you're ringing a client or um, trying to get them on video conferencing, they're often walking around, they're at the shops, they've forgotten what their, that the, that the appointment was there and all of a sudden, oh, yeah, that's right, I was going to do that. But actually that's a sense of preparation in someone's mind as to what they're doing for the day is as, is as important as the, as the appointment or the session, I think. Yeah. Uh, Mark, what, what's your experience in this area? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's a, a very important part of what we do. And I guess everyone's very aware of the sort of YouTube um, thing by Johan Hari around, you know, the opposite of addiction is connection. And so we fundamentally believe that this is an important aspect of what our service model should deliver. And I think um, supporting the, the peer support, mutual aid type groups have, have been a really strong thing to continue through the COVID time, everything going online, having, you know, Zoom meetings for SMART or NA or AA has been a really positive thing. Um, I think the, the role of peer support, we haven't developed enough in our region. I'm a bit like Beth, I can only really talk about from our perspective, but uh, that's an area we're really starting to gain a lot of momentum now with a dedicated position to drive that and one of the things about having a, an aftercare kind of group we have a a uh, sliding doors which is a non-residential day rehab program that operates and that transitioned to online very well and had great retention of people in the group and i think the, a lot of the feedback was it was about the social connection so the fact that people could come together they they then started to move into having kind of lunchtime catch-ups which weren't formal so people could just have a chat on zoom and that was well received as well so i think um yeah if we, we need to be very much thinking about social connection and i, I was really um i guess it's ha saddened i suppose in in the you know that the drug and alcohol services for some of those people that responded to the survey they that was their form of social connection but i think we we need to embrace that and um do what we can to respond. So um, I do think it should be a formalised part of what we do. Um, and I think the growth of peer support programs is, is the way to go. I've, I've come from a background in mental health where peer support, um, when it first came out, was a bit, no one really knew how to work with it. As it evolved, it got more formal, it got a lot of respect and, and um, become just an embedded part of practice. And I'm really hopeful of seeing that happen within the drug and alcohol sector as well. So... Um, it's interesting, yeah, I'm a big fan. Uh, the, um, you know, yeah, it did sad to me that idea that um, this is sometimes the, the most social connection somebody has. I've always kind of said, you know, work, working in an NSP or working as a drug and alcohol clinician, it sounds very Pollyanna, but actually smiling at a person might be the only smile that they get that day. It might be that they're, you know, that eye, eye contact's being avoided or they're being, um, you know, judged or stigmatised on the street or um, particularly for some of our more vulnerable clients and um, actually we forget how countercultural it is that they might enjoy having a chat and a smile and a sound silly a touch on the arm or you know a, a handshake that stuff is actually um, potentially um, very powerful for people who are not used to it yeah yeah I, I think um that's a, um, a, a super good point. And, and what's running through my head as well is that um, really uh, as a peer organization um, over the years, we've always sort of, we've often focused on community development approaches to the work that we do. You know, we're not direct AOD service providers, but um, so much of the work that we do, and I think something that um, we can probably think about that this has helped us think about is the fact that, um, the work that we do is is all about fostering connections within our communities and our social groups and within peer groups of people so that um, they do have those connections within their own um, within their own lives and 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 as wonderful as it is, as it is to have an island like a uh, you know an NSP or an AOD service provider that provides you know um, an island of uh, of calm in your day um, we also really think it's important. And I think this is sort of highlighting how important it is to um, support communities and, and, and groups of 
peers to really be able to support themselves informally as well. And um, to answer, I suppose, to answer that question, formalizing um, social connection is tricky, but I definitely think we should be, I think there's ways to do it um, in, 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 as all the panelists have mentioned. Um, but I think it's also worth thinking about how we recognize it um, and how we're able to, if not report on it, at least share it, sh share the importance of it with funders and with the, with the, with this, um, you know, with the wider sector and, and with mm. uh, the public uh, it, it, as well. Yeah. I think that there are different approaches to that, you know, um, there are different approaches to that in terms of the media and, and so on, but, um, but, but yeah, fundamentally, um, as a peer support and a peer um, organisation ourselves, we've, sort of really fully try to um, leverage people's resilience and, and connection. Um, yeah. And also, yeah, remind people that often groups of people who use drugs are our are, are communities as well. Yeah. And that's exactly, it. Scott made a comment uh, that um, the AOD sector uh, probably does largely recognize the importance of social connection uh, and the role that services play here, but um, it's not recognized in funding models. So that's probably uh, where it can get a greater recognition. I, th I think that's the, the next stage, Adita. It's, we've got to have you know, funded positions to, to really legitimize the mm. role and to take this where it needs to go, I think, which is a, a being a big part of our service system. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's go to another uh, major uh, topic um, from our consultation, and uh, that is this issue of digital divide and lack of um, IT skills and equipment and internet access, which have become a, a great um, source of social exclusion. What does this mean for the AOD sector? Um, how do services deal with this? What, what has been your experience during these last few months uh, in this regard? And um, what should be done about it? And um, Mark, would you? Yeah, sure. Or, yeah. Um, yeah I, I definitely think it is the, the brave new world that we're all starting to rock it into with the, the whole thing with COVID. I, I think, um, you know, I was quite, openly uh, not an advocate for telehealth and those sort of things prior to this being thrust upon me. And it's kind of that situation where you, you fear what you don't know and you try and avoid what you don't know. But when you're forced into that experience, you start to realise actually, no, there's some really good things about this. And um, for us, we're, we're a rural service. So accessibility for people when, you know, lost licences for drink drive and, you know, all sorts of different barriers get in the way. Um, having kids at home also was another big, thing for some of our participants and and so I think we've really got to embrace the IT world and we've just got to start to switch our thinking into how can we do this rather than my previous thinking which is how can I avoid this or delay it so um, I'm a, yeah, a, a big advocate for it and, and there's just even in some of the the um, I, I run a, a facilitator smart recovery group and the, the amount of participants that come into those meetings to talk about different apps they're using and, you know, oh, I use this one and I find that really good and I've been using this mindfulness one and I've been using this, you know, sober time one or whatever it might be. So I think we've, we've just got to um, move forward and pretty rapidly, really, to broaden our skill set and our repertoire of um, things we offer as a drug and alcohol service now around this. But bearing in mind also from the study you presented that you know some people still have access issues and, mm. and I think that was a big thing for us we utilized yeah. the court funds to help support with purchasing data for people to engage in our um, day mm. rehab program so I guess we've yeah. got to think about different ways we use the money that comes into the to support our programs so, yeah there's a it's just it's a it's a uh, an evolving space, I think, and we've just got to be open to that evolution and really start to think differently around all these areas. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mark. Sioni, I have a, a question in uh, from the audience about how harm reduction. I'm curious myself how harm reduction has uh, has gone with this issue uh, and has worked uh, in the digital age. Um, 
Uh, are, we are you talking about the um, the drop in centers? Well, in general. Um, no. Okay. The, yeah. the, so, in your experience. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sure. Well, um, yeah. It's um, uh, it's a double edged. I think um, we've got a bit of a double edged sword sort of situation going on where I think. Like it's um, as Mark said, it's really important that we embrace um, opportunities moving forwards. But remember that, um, especially you know, the most marginalised and and I suppose vulnerable, if you want to use that term, um, the most marginalised people in our society are probably the most uh, are often often the least likely to have um, at least consistent access to. Um, to IT, as you talked about, which is um, really important to remember. And even just in terms of quality, you know, it's, it's really not the same doing a Zoom meeting on a mobile um, or, or try, uh, at least certainly not for, a, not for a, a long period of time. I think the other thing to remember, I think the other thing to remember is that so much of our communication is nonverbal. Um, and I think that's one thing that Zoom's really, that this period has really um, made jump out for us for me in particular is that um, is, is that a lot of communication is lacking when, when using screens only and I think particularly when we're talking about soft communication and communication around um, issues like AOD which are not um, you know it's not all facts based a lot of it is about how we're feeling and how we're um, going at the, at the moment and I think um, and, and that's not to say we shouldn't use um, technology and the opportunities we have but it's to say we should really think about how we how we use them and, and what different approaches we can take over time and what we're going to learn over time. And I think that's the, um, that's the key. You know, we've definitely as an organization um, found that um, um, communicating and accessing, um, you know, some of our, some of our uh, community has been um, made much harder um, and we haven't been able to do it as successfully as we have with other parts of the community. Um, and so, <clears throat> Um, it's, it's really about finding uh, horses for courses, you know, on the upside, um, we've been able to, um, you know, deliver training to people in regional areas that we found it tricky to access in the past. And, you know, um, rather than, you know, being able to have 20 or 30 people at a session uh, from all different parts of the state or even country sometimes, um, uh, you know, can be really efficient. Um, so those sort of, that, that sort of stuff's really important. Um, our um, our DanceWise program has, um, sort of pivoted to be able to do really good peer education um, and and training for their for their community uh, as well as videos. And so it's definitely something that um, that we should embrace, but also be just really aware that we, there is an there is a risk, I think, of accelerating the inequity that already ex inequity that already ex exists. Because as we go back to, uh, I think the health will be slow to go back to face to face. Um, work and so those people who are missing out are going to miss out for longer um, and probably fall even further behind so how we uh, rectify that is an ongoing challenge yes definitely um, look I just want to address a few questions from the audience so there's a question about what were the service type types um, for those details I would invite you to uh, download the report because I don't uh, want to try listing them from the top of my head now, but um, that kind of details you can find in report is quite com comprehensive. Um, in terms of, um, uh, there, there was a question about uh, uh, pharmacotherapy clients and if anyone was on long-term injectable um, ibuprofen and, and we, no, we didn't have any participants. So we had uh, nine participants who were all, um, um, on traditional pharmacotherapy. Um, so I, I um, guy, talking about pharmacotherapy, uh, Sioni, um, this has been the only area that, um, according to our consultation, has improved in service users' experience from uh, before COVID. Um, and uh, you know the telehealth uh, significantly made access to prescribing doctors more easy, um, and the geographical distribution of doctors, which is normally a huge issue, um, wasn't such a, a major issue anymore. So, um, 
can we see this as an opportunity to get more people on pharmacotherapy program? And how do we take advantage of this situation? I th yeah, I think number one is we need to try and keep the changes um, where, where possible. And so, um, and they all have different impacts, I suppose. Um, I think it's worth reminding ourselves that from a, on a systemic level, we're coming from a pretty low base to some degree with pharmacotherapy. And what I mean by that is that it's, people find it quite restrictive and, and, and often difficult to, uh, difficult to um, stick to all the different rules and to go and see a doctor uh, every month and just go to the chemist six to seven times, five, six, seven times a week. Um, and so being able to move away from doing that is, it's not a surprise that people found that to be liberating and um, that, it, that, it, that it helped them. Um, and I think that without a doubt, telehealth, so separating out the, the, the takeaways and so forth from, from the telehealth situation, I think that um, that's one of our real, you know, the, the number of prescribers in Victoria is one of the real challenges that we have to um, overcome. And so if, if, um, if the opportunity to do um, to do re at least the at least the regular rescripting through telehealth um, is an opportunity for people that'd be great. But I think that a lot of a lot of GPs and uh, addiction medicine specialists would probably still want to see people physically initially anyway. And so the tyranny of distance thing is probably still not going to be completely solved by telehealth. But I'd like to think that it will help a lot. Um, so. Uh, particularly potentially if there's an opportunity you know if, if it, particularly yeah. if it's about maintaining um scripting yeah yeah thank you Sione. we're running out of time so let's just conclude on um learning curve note um uh, so what are some learnings that from this extraordinary situation where we had to be flexible and creative and adapt what what can we um bring forward and uh, there is also a question from the audience if you could turn back time what would you do differently so um if we can just keep it short because i know they'll kick us off soon um but do you want to sure I, I guess my learning is that we are creative and we are flexible so um we have a resilient workforce we have a resilient um, population that we work with um you know there it's obviously not been ideal it's not been the best practice that we could do and we've suffered lots of moral injuries as a result. Um, could we be doing this differently and would that have made a better outcome? But we've been flexible and been creative um, and hopefully we've got some things now that kind of complement our service and add to our service rather than take away from it, such as telehealth options. Thank you, Beth. Mark, do you want to share? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Beth pretty much nailed it. it. It has been, as I said before, it was a, a change in how we deliver services that I think have been well received by some, but not all. We, we need to now blend these two kind of models of the, the digital world into the face-to-face uh, -face world. And I think that's a challenge for us. I don't think we've got it all right yet. Um, as to the second question as to if I had my time again, you know, um, I really don't think we could have changed. We'd we just we 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 kind of needed something like this to push us into this new age. So I sort of feel like I probably couldn't do much differently now. But the other side of it is it's it's also got us looking at things like our website, looking at what apps apps we have available to people. How do we set up kind of chat rooms and you know face group, Facebook type groups and all sorts of just starting to explore all these potential opportunities out there now. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited in a way and a bit nervous. It's a brave new world. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Sioni? Oh, look, um, I won't repeat what Beth and Mark said, but I, I broadly agree with those uh, comments. I suppose I'd leave it with uh, a slightly downbeat one, which is that I think um, it's probably important to remember that we're still, you know, we're still, it'll be a while before we know just um, just what impact this has had on the community Um as a whole, um, you know, the people that we've missed, uh, the people who haven't had um, the access that they might have had otherwise, and, and beyond AOD as well, with other other health, uh, with other health uh, care access as well. And I think mm. that um, that will be interesting to see over the years, the over the months and years um, ahead of us. There'll be a lot of uh, food for researchers and for um, organisations like ours and services like ours to um, to, to work on. Thank you, Sione. Uh, with that, we have to finish. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. If you have any questions that I couldn't answer, please contact me directly. I'm happy to 
talk to you further. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much, editor and Mark and Beth and Sione. It's an incredible piece of research, and um, as I'm as I'm sure you could tell by the um, the very interesting questions in the Q and A panel and and in the chat as well. Thanks so much to our engaged audience. I know it's hard to to um. To, to do all of these things through Zoom, but it's but it makes it much easier when we have such fantastic panel members. On to our next uh, part of today's proceedings. I am very delighted to um, introduce you all to Turning Point Strategic Lead of Clinical and Social Research, Michael Savage, someone who I haven't seen for many years. Lovely to see your face, Michael. Um, who's going to uh, give us just a little bit of an interlude, a brief overview, um, exploring uh, alcohol and other drug treatment clients' experiences of telehealth during co the COVID-19 pandemic and um, just give us an update on your research, which seems very pertinent given the, the previous discussion. Over to you, Michael. Uh, thanks so much, Eliza. Um, yeah, uh, thanks for having me here. It's a real pleasure. And I won't take up much time, as Eliza said. So basically, I just wanted to briefly flag uh, a new project funded by the Department of Health and Human Services that myself, Vic Manning, and colleagues at Monash Union Turning Point are uh, conducting. So our project flows really nicely, as Eliza said, from the great work at EDA just presented and, and the really great discussion we just heard. Um, in our project, we'll be focusing more specifically on uh, AOD treatment clients and experiences of telehealth during the pandemic, but we'll also be comparing these with uh, experiences of in-person care before the pandemic, as well as getting uh, a better understanding of uh, client experiences of telehealth. We're also um, exploring people's preferences about how future AOD um, telehealth services are delivered, I guess, during and beyond uh, the pandemic. So what, what might flow um, uh, hopefully beyond the pandemic. Um, I, I guess, why are we doing all of this? Well, we're hoping to generate some uh, useful insights for services and policy makers um, to build on uh, the work that Adita and others have done about ways to enhance the delivery of um, telehealth. Um, in terms of what's involved, we're about to launch a, a brief client online survey and do some in-depth qualitative interviews. Uh, we'll be reimbursing people who take part in the interviews and, and, and um, there'll be a prize for the survey. So we'll provide some more information about the project and a link to the online survey via the BADA, the news and other channels. So please keep uh, an eye out. Uh, but we'd really appreciate your help in dis distributing the survey link, kind of spreading the word about the, um, the, the project, the clients at your service through emails or SMS or whatever way works best for you. Um, I think that's, that's the study in a nutshell, so I'll leave it there for now, but please feel free to uh, email me with any questions or thoughts. Um, and I look forward to hopefully um, being in a similar forum, uh, perhaps even in person, to be able to kind of uh, present the results. Thanks. That's awesome, Michael. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. And it sounds really exciting, especially on the back of what we've just heard. I wonder if that theme of connection also comes up um, in, in what you're looking at. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Okay. So, the, so, Part three um, of our webinar for today on COVID and the community and, and um, consumers in the community and the AOD sector. I um, will be chairing this next part, um, chairing a panel of um, fantastic people who I'll introduce to you shortly. Particularly though, I want to start by setting the scene because we're talking about something, one of the most striking uh, striking and uh, curious, I'm trying to find the right word, um, for uh, what happened to um, nine of our uh, public housing towers uh, in Melbourne during the COVID-19, uh, what's been called the hard lockdown of Melbourne's public housing towers. So to set the scene, um, I'm very grateful to Julia and Scott at FADA for pulling together this uh, very, um, 
brief but informative um, timeline of the of the events that we're about that took place that we're about to speak through. Disturbing is a great word, Caroline. Thank you very much. That's exactly what it was. Okay. So, as you're all um, no doubt very familiar, uh, in Flemington, Kensington and North Melbourne, there were nine public housing towers that were subject to what was colloquially um, termed in the media and elsewhere a hard lockdown from 3pm on the 4th of July uh, this year. There wasn't much notice given and um, not for the people in the towers nor for the service responses or anybody involved for that matter. 3 p.m. Was a, was a pretty rushed deadline. There were 1,345 units in total across those nine towers and approximately 3,000 residents um, impacted, not to mention also, um, as we now know from the news reports and the, and the reports uh, coming out from community, the friends and family who may not have necessarily resided in the towers but were there at 3 p.m. deadline and so remained there for the rest of the lockdown. The number of police, which is one of the most extraordinary elements of this response um, per shift for um, across the nine sites was approximately 500. So 500 um, officers across uh, across nine sites, which effectively three, three, three um, sites in the one big site. And anyway, you get the picture. In terms of the in terms of the explanation for the reason for the hard lockdown, um, the Department of Health and Human Services reported that on um, on the fourth of July there were 108 new cases recorded in Victoria. It was the second worst daily total to that date. Um, if you can, it's unfortunately not that long ago. So I'm sure that even. Um, the stage that we've just come out of stage four restrictions, stage three, um, and, and coming back into what the Premier is now terming COVID normal. Um, so, so I'm sure that you can all put yourselves back to not that long ago on the 4th of July. There were 27 total recorded cases in the towers by the 5th of July, 14 in Flemington and 33 in North Melbourne. On the 8th of July, there were 75 total recorded cases in those towers. And finally, on the 18th of July, across the tower sites, there were 286 cases. Next slide, please, Julia. Some towers didn't contain confirmed cases of COVID, but as we were um, made aware through the media and, and other social media channels, um, they were locked down on precautionary principle um, DHHS assumed control of the operation. The lockdowns uh, directions were made under the Public Health and Wellbeing Act of 2008 in Victoria. And it's important to note that the provisions that were used in the Act, namely the um, uh, detention um, directions, had never been used before. There were a range of health services, community groups and AOD agencies, some of whom are re uh, represented on our panels today, um, who were immediately on the ground um, providing support and assistance to those affected by the lockdown. Um, it's also important to note, and, and I want to pay a ma um, give a massive shout out to the number of community groups who just rallied um, the, the community within the towers and the community surrounding the towers, supporting friends and family and all sorts of engaged groups um, who really rolled up their sleeves and, and turned out in droves to, to try to, to attempt to provide some support for the people that um, were subject to the, to the detention directions. Next slide, please, Julia. So the Australian Acting Chief Medical Officer at the time, Paul Kelly, um, Professor Paul Kelly, compared the towers to vertical cruise ships. Um, if you could cast your minds back even further to March, April and May, um, cruise ships became um, synonymous with, uh, with COVID um, panic. Daniel Andrews noted, this is not about punishment, but protection. Um, noting, of course, that uh, he also at the same time deployed 500 <laughs> police officers to the, three, to the three sites. No rent would be charged, according to uh, the Premier, 
for those affected by the hard lockdown and in, in addition, $1,500 of hardship payments for those unable to go to work and $750 for those without paid work. And I think we'll hear more about that from um, Abdi, one of our panelists who was a community member on the ground um, at the time. By the end of the lockdown on the 10th of July, eight of the towers were moved to stage three restrictions and the tower at 33 Alfred Street, which recorded 53 infections um, total in, in that time, was quarantined for a further nine days. The lockdown of the tower at 33 Alfred Street ended on Sunday, the 19th of July, 2020. And to date, we haven't seen um, another response uh, similar. So that gives you some... Uh, a context for the panel member for the discussion that's now about to uh, ensue and I would like now to welcome my panel members um, to the stage to the zoom stage uh, so that I can introduce them and, and um, we can uh, start having a discussion. So um, the first panel member that I want to introduce <coughs> Uh, is Gary Morris, who is the manager of AOD Design and Development. Gary's a social worker. He's had, got over 30 years experience in health and human services, which is almost nearly more than I've been alive, including mental health, forensic mental health, corrections and problem gambling. And the reason I'm introducing Gary first is because he's also got a, um, a, a flow chart um, and wants to take us through it to set the scene even further. Over to you, Gary. Uh, thanks very much and uh, for the opportunity to talk today. Um, this is a flowchart that was done pretty much on the fly on uh, the weekend when we first informed. So um, just to give some context, John Ryan, uh, the CEO of Pennington, rang me on Saturday afternoon and started talking about a lockdown, which I assumed he was talking about um, suburban lockdowns, um, as I wasn't um, aware of what was happening at the towers. Uh, basically, once I got off the phone speaking to John, I noticed a whole lot of missed calls from a work phone, um, and that was the first we knew of it on uh, mid Saturday afternoon. Uh, so, basically, within the AOD program area, we started uh, commencing work on how we we're going to approach um, providing support. Um, and one of the key things was to look at a model in which we could actually uh, articulate and put out to people to have a common uh, model in which we could operate and ensure that all AOD uh, program areas were covered and most importantly that the needs of the consumers within the towers could be addressed. Um, so this work started on uh, Saturday afternoon, continued all day on Sunday. Um, during that time, we're engaging with a whole heap of stakeholders in being able to put this together, which included VADA, uh, Pennington Institute, uh, Harm Reduction Victoria. We had a lot of input with Nico Clark, who was the head of addiction medicine specialist at uh, Royal Melbourne Hospital, and so by and also obviously with our partners, Co Health, who um, had the primary health sort of clinic on the ground. So uh, this model was sort of put together and was sort of operational by Monday morning. As you can see, uh, the key number for clients was to access uh, CoHealth um, via the housing support line. Everything was going through to CoHealth, so we had it funneled to one um, service rather than uh, making it complicated for service providers and, and clients in terms of being able to access. Um, CoHealth also being the primary health service uh, covering that area had a good uh, understanding or a high number of clients who resided in that uh, facility. We're also ensuring that there was continuation of care by also putting out through VADA and communicating through other channels with services to try and reach in to their clients. Um, as you know, continuity care is a really important consideration. In addition to that, we're also dealing um, with consumables around NSP, um, ensuring that we have had enough supplies and getting enough supplies through to co-health and increasing that. We're also working with pharmacotherapy to uh, make sure that uh, chemists and uh, pharmacotherapy products, uh, brivimorphine and methadone were able to be distributed to the towers. In addition to that, um, we're also working in with our mental health colleagues um, to ensure that the AOD mental health was a collaborative uh, approach. 
Thanks, Gary. Thanks for that overview. Um, okay, and, and, and on the back of that, I'd like to now introduce our other um, panel members for today. And while everybody is getting ready and we're, we're switching over screens, I'd also just like to um, make a comment that we um, obviously, as, as mentioned in the preamble, that um, Victoria Police were a large part of the, of the hard lockdown response. Um, they were, VADA did invite them to participate today. Unfortunately, um, they weren't, they declined um, the invitation and um, have sent forward this statement, which I'll briefly read out now um, in the interest of fairness. Uh, unfortunately, Victoria Police cannot participate in the webinar because there is legal action pending regarding the response to the public housing lockdown, which prevents or at least makes it very difficult for VicPol to publicly discuss our role. They've also commented that also as Victoria Police was not the lead agency in the operation, it may be more suitable for the lead agency DHHS. Um, Gary is our representative today to speak to the how and the why of the lockdown. So in, fair, in fairness, I just wanted to, um, to read that out and share that with you. Um, the first panel member that I would like to introduce is uh, Steph Janitas. And Steph is from Harm Reduction Victoria, a colleague of Sione's who we've met um, previously today. Uh, she's been a Harm Reduction Victoria's Dance Wise pro Program Coordinator since July 2013, so um, more than seven years, and Program Director since August 2020. She's a qualified lawyer, having volunteered at a community law centre for several years. She's got a grad dip in med medical and health law, as well as completing studies in humanities and alcohol and other drugs, and is a member of a number of boards, and I have no idea how she fits all of that in. Leanna Helquist uh, from CoHealth is the AOD and homelessness cluster leader at, at CoHealth and is the operation, oh, sorry, and this operational and strategic role oversees CoHealth's harm reduction and community treatment services in the inner no, um, northwest of Melbourne. Leanna is interested in quality improvement, strategic and change management, clinical governance, and working with stakeholders to provide best uh, to provide best care every time. Both um, Leanna and Steph were in various ways involved um, with directly with the response to the uh, hard lockdown um, over time. And finally, I'd like to introduce um, Abdi Ishmael, who we are very, very fortunate um, to have with us today. Abdi is a community health concierge at CoHealth and was also um, it also, although not a resident of the Towers, certainly one of those people uh, who has family in the Towers and, and was visiting them. So it was one of those people at the time who got caught up um, in the lockdown. So was the three part of the plus in the 3,000 um, plus people that were impacted by um, the hard lockdown at 3 p.m. on that 4th of July. It's an extraordinary um, pleasure to have Abdi on board to give some uh, real insights into what community experience, um, which is an extraordinarily important part of all of this. Um, curious and, and as Carolyn made the point earlier, disturbing um, uh, the situation that unfolded on the day. So without further ado, I'm going to open, um, open it up to a facilitated uh, discussion today. One of the things that I would love for all of you to do um, out there and in, in the in attendee land is if you would like to, if you have any questions for the panelists at all, as you start to hear um, their views unfold and, and their recounts and reflections and experience of their experiences. Please just pop your questions into the um, Q&A box like you were doing for Editor's Amazing presentation and I will get to them as soon as we possibly can. I'll try to make sure that I get to everybody's um, just so that you know though if, if we don't um, I will I'll try and uh, if, you, if you've got a pressing concern let me know in the in the chat and I'll and I'll get to you then. All right, so I'm going to open up, open it up to all of you, Gary. Um, I know that you've you've um, very, uh, very gratefully, um, gratefully. No, I'm grateful. You're you're very obligingly put forward um, that flow chart. Um, so we might. So instead of uh, putting you on the spot first, I might actually um, start with Leanna. Um, but this will be a question for all panelists. Leanna, what do you think went well and what didn't go so well? Thanks so much. Um, look, I think lots did go well. And I think from what didn't go well, we learnt as we went um, and we kind of adapted as we as we went. So I think that, I guess, 
in terms of a negative, we kind of turned it into a positive. We learned as we went. So in the first couple of days, um, as Gary said, you know, we're the primary, primary community health service in that region. So we were able to kind of find who all our clients were living in those um, areas and we were able to contact them by, by phone and provide um, support, information and um, offer the continuity of care. Uh, we had uh, staff on the ground um, in the first days and over the weekend. So we had our um, specialist AOD clinicians, we had um, medical practitioners, we had nurses and we had um, social workers on the ground pretty much immediately. We, in the first couple of days, we did door knocking. So we knocked on every door. Um, I think that was on the Tuesday um, to provide, again, information, support, access to information. And we... Uh, all through that time, um, we and we still are providing kind of a primary health um, service on the ground um, at Flemington and North Melbourne. So we, um, like Gary said, we set up a direct line, direct to co-health, so people could um, access health and support services directly from us. We could coordinate that for them. We were um, able to, you know, provide... Um, Kind of opioid replacement to people, NSP, we were taking it directly to people's homes. Um, um, I think we had, um, so as well as our experienced kind of AOD clinicians, um, we were working with our partners, um, mental health um, providers as well to coordinate services for people. We had um, bilingual workers on site as well and um, we not only provided a kind of clinical primary health response, but a kind of a social welfare response. So, you know, if people needed a toys for the kids or um, some over-the-counter medication um, or supports or some um, specialist food or baby formula, we were able to provide that as well. So we tried to provide a kind of holistic um, point of contact for people. Um, I think um, over the week, we were able to work with our kind of community partners and community leaders on site to develop some more specific ta targeted um, information and um, information about supports and where people could access. So um, I guess pulling on our partnerships and our local contacts was really important. Um, that was seen as, a, I guess, a big strength that we had those um, partners uh, contacts already in place. I think you know, I guess thinking about like our clinical knowledge in terms of, you know, how to, how to manage um, kind of the infection control, how to access the services paired with our kind of community contacts, developing kind of translated resources, contacting people in their own language was, I think, a real strength. Um, I think um, the other challenge was for us on the ground, especially in those first few days, was around, I guess, um, knowing, like, I guess kind of what Sione was talking about is knowing where the gaps were. So we knew who our, our clients were, we, um, we could contact them, but we were, you know, particularly worried about the households that weren't reaching out for assistance and help, um, weren't identifying um, that via our lines or the DHHS line. So we were really, um, I guess, concerned about those households and who was kind of mm. through the gaps. Um, and I think, I guess the other kind of learning um, was, and we could probably talk about this a bit more, but I guess thinking about, uh, like, I guess more that prevention is prevention rather than cure. So, you know, particularly, and I think that's what we've really learned is that, um, you know, engaging with community earlier, um, providing them the ability to um, kind of live, like have it live in a safe way, preventing the um, transmission, providing kind of education, information, support, you know, practical support to people, um, I guess, earlier than what, what we really um, did in the end was a, was a big learning for us. Yeah, great. Thanks, Leanna. Um, and it sounds like there was an incredible amount of work <laughs> done um, and that would have been an enormous job to coordinate by CoHealth. Um, Steph, I am going to hand it over to you now. What what worked well? What didn't from your from your point of view? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what worked well, I would have to say, is um, the community members, the residents inside the the flats, the community volunteers were excellent, and uh, 
should have been the operational lead the whole time. Um, the nurses and the co-health staff, the way that they treated all the residents was excellent. Um, and the nurses were so efficient when going through and doing the tests. Uh, on the ground support from DHHS was also excellent. It, everything was there on the ground. Um, what didn't go well is that there was a big gap between what was on the ground and what was able to get into the apartments. And uh, I do have to admit that I have an emotional response to Victoria Police's statement that they were not the lead agency because maybe that's true on paper, but in practice, they did create one of the most significant barriers in terms of getting access, health services access to people in the individual apartments. Um, so yeah. Beautiful. That's um, uh, very, very succinct and to the point, Steph. Thank you. Um, Abdi, uh, Steph just talked about um, the extraordinary com um, response from the community. What do you think went well and, and what didn't go so well? To be honest, like for, for me, since I was locked up, most of the time I haven't seen anything. Since we were locked up there, we didn't get much stuff. So from mine, I wouldn't say anything really went well. Because mm -hmm. we had some family that are on disability, and since my sister-in-law was pregnant, nobody checked up on a lot of people that are on medication. No one ever thought about does anyone anyone need anything. People were just looking at our offices, make sure no one comes down, make sure no one does that. No one checked. Is anyone that need to go to their doctors? Anyone has appointment actually important, like a doctor appointment, which my sister she was meant to go to a woman. She's pregnant. She's due in a couple of weeks. And no really. Like checked on a lot of information that are really important, the keys, and especially with providing food, which that was gross. Like what the food, the food that we received, which I myself even one time I ordered Uber Eats. The communication wasn't really good, and I had to go through the community center, my public community center. I think sheriff people were there, and I was like, why did they have to go through? You know, checkpoint to get it. It's not like a border security. I, I just give me my food, and I go back upstairs. I don't need you know my food to receive after seven hours later which my food is wet, it was a raining day. I'm like, I can't eat this food right now. And the officers really didn't know what to say sometimes, they were confused. And some DHS workers were downstairs, they were really nice, but there was a lot of communication what they say on us on the phone when we call them and we tell them what's going on. They'll tell us well, who's working on the ground, you know, they should be, they should know who's there, the location and everyone, the same company. There was a lot of conversation like it, was, it wasn't going well. And I had to give to the officers and be like, Yep, this DHS worker, officer, some officers will tell you no. Some officers were actually nice. It depends which shift they were working. So it was a lot of things that didn't go quite well. Uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't tell me. Obviously, I wasn't happy due to what what happened to us, which I wasn't even meant to be there. I just came to take food to my brother, and I got told, you can't go back downstairs. And I had to sleep for 14 days on a couch. Yeah. And I couldn't leave. Or somewhere, uh, like... I, didn't, I used to live here, I was raised here. I went to Dudley Murders on Flemington, but even though I moved away from here and I come here on weekends, but I wasn't meant to be there at that time. I had work to do, I had other stuff to do and I couldn't just go back up just because I went to go take grocery. And then cops officers tell me, man, you can't go back. I was like, I live here, check my ID, check my information. I'm like, nah, you gotta stay here. I'm like, where do you want to sleep? And they're like, nah, we're gonna arrest you if you don't go back upstairs. And I didn't want to leave to that, that point. So obviously, I went crazy to myself. My brother just told me, just come and stay here for the meantime, you know? So it was a lot of things that went awful. But at the same time, there's a lot of good things that happened. Was a lot of volunteers came from around Melbourne to bring us food, to bring provide a lot of stuff, especially the AMSA youth across the road where the mosque is. A lot of people were helping out, bringing stuff, medication, people just like going back and forth in Flemington, you know, especially seeing, I don't know if you guys saw a video in Flemington, officers hitting volunteers that are trying to get into the building to provide food and med medication. The officers are arresting them and bashing them like it's ungrateful. Like you guys are already in the wrong and you guys are still hitting people that are helping people that are locked up. Even though we had a meeting with Victorian police, there was a lot of things that go wrong. But yeah, awful yeah. Lot it sounds like an, um, uh, an extraordinarily um, stressful and, and in many ways, uh, surreal experience for you, Abdi. Um, I, it, it strikes me that um, had you delivered groceries at 11 a.m. rather than somewhere around 3 p.m., um, you might have been walking out of there and, and turned around. <laughs> um, 
but uh, yeah, extraordinary. But also, um, I, I really take your point about um, the community response as well. I think that's been a theme, a theme all the way through, Leanna and Steph. And so that brings me to Gary. Um, hopefully, um, you've you've uh, you've caught your breath and um, and able to uh, answer from your point of view what went well and what didn't go so well. Ah, uh, what went well. Um... I guess it's in the context of it's an unprecedented event and there was um, really no roadmap um, in sort of how we'd do this. Um, so what really went well was really that coordination with a common sense of purpose, you know, working with CoHealth, working with Harm Reduction Victoria, working with Nico Clark from, you know, um, Royal Melbourne, uh, working with Pennington, VADA, all the stakeholders coming together with a common sense of purpose to make a very difficult situation um, and try and work to get the best outcomes we could. And so that was really, um, for me, the, the best thing that came out of that, um, that people work tirelessly to try and get achieve those outcomes. And, yeah. you know, at times there were numerous roadblocks or barriers uh, to provide services. And um, we just had to keep on pushing to negotiate, um, advocate, um, really sort of work hard to ensure that um, supplies and uh, those things were in place for people. Um, so really, um, that were the positives that really came out of it. Um, the difficulty is, you know, one moment um, you run a pharmacotherapy program and next minute you're trying to work out, well, hold on a second, now we have to try and get medication from a pharmacist into a public housing tower. How do we do that? What are the logistics to get it there? You know, how do we pay for the fees? How do we do this? So, you know, though putting those things in place within a day or two um, took a lot of work from a number of people to make that happen, whether it be the local chemist um, who were in, in the first couple of days were actually turning up themselves to distribute the medication. Um, mm. In some cases, it was the police taking that medication up to people within the building. So, you know, um, it, it was very difficult. And um, I think, you know, in, that was the learnings of it, really, that joint collaborative process. Yeah, it certainly did. Um, it did bring together a whole lot of people really quickly. Um, and, and it did certainly from, from where I was sitting um, in, a, in a, you know, four, five, six steps removed place. Um, it was a, it, there was an extraordinary sense of, um, from the community groups and from the people on the ground, Steph, I think, as you mentioned, and Leanna as well, um, a sense of camaraderie. And, and wanting to come together and make it work um, in, in extraordinary circumstances. Um, thank you, Gary. We've got a few questions. I've got a few more questions for you all, but I'm but I'm going to throw it open to the um, to the to the audience now because there's the questions are coming in thick and fast. So. Um, Leanna, there's a question for you about needing to recruit additional staff in order to respond. Is that something that you had to contend with? And if so, how did you do that? Uh, so thanks for the question, Molly. Uh, we <laughs> did have to recruit some extra staff. We didn't really recruit any kind of AOD or social work outreach staff. Uh, we were able to have uh, use our existing capacity within CoHealth to provide those services. However, you know, our GP and nursing staff, we um, used our, I guess, our networks in, uh, in, the, in the region. Lots of GPs and nurses put up their hands and volunteered to come in and kind of assist us um, to provide the support services. DHHS um, were able to provide some nurses as well. So, um, yeah, we were over that, um, I guess, the second half of the first week and, in, and ongoing, we've had to recruit extra um, clinical staff, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did that pose a challenge for you? Like, was it was it something that you? Um, uh, like, yeah. Like I think, like everyone said, I think everyone, I, it really, I guess, galvanised people into wanting to help and assist. So, um, kind of what Gary and Steph have already mentioned. You know, the other example I have is that um, chemists would reach out to us and link us up with. Um, people that they knew were residents um, who were on pharmacotherapy. So we were able to um, you know, reach out and coordinate that for people as well. So everyone, 
um, you know, we felt on the ground, everyone was kind of, you know, really trying to work hard to make sure people had their continuity of service and had their existing services in place. And, and as Abdi was saying, that wasn't always possible. Um, we, there was difficulty getting aged care and um, disability services in. Um, so we, even though we were meeting kind of basic needs in terms of healthcare, there were challenges getting other services in, in for people. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Leanna. And thanks also, Molly, for the question. Um, there's a question in here uh, also from an attendee um, about emergency management plans. And in fact, it's one of the questions that I also had um, prepared for all of you. The, the attendee has said the quality of food was a disgrace. Abdi, you were mentioning that earlier. How was it even possible to have out-of-date uh, sorry, I'm sorry, out of date food distributed to the residents. Um, is there a food management plan that should, uh, should a disaster involving a similar lockdown occur, i.e. food quality and access? Um, Gary, that might be a question for you. Um, and maybe we'll even broaden that, that question um, to uh, disaster management in general. Um, this, is, this is certainly specific to uh, the COVID pandemic as it's currently happened. Um, but, but it will not be, unfortunately, the only time that we're, we find ourselves in a state of emergency or potentially even a state of disaster and need to respond in, in such a, a quick turnaround way. In terms of disaster management plans, what are your, um, do you, perhaps I'll, I'll send, send the question your way first. All right. Um, I don't work in the emergency management area, so I'll just uh, make sure I put that on the table to start with. But uh, look, the most important thing about this is like anything in these circumstances is the ability to sit back and be reflective and to have an open review of those situations. Now, the government's been open to criticism, whether it be the hotel quarantine, and obviously had, had a review to try and get to the bottom of that. And I'm sure with Operation Benassari, which had the um, command structure that over, over had over side of the towers that there will certainly be internal pro you know internal reviews taking place as to how those um, how things were um, operationalized um, how effective were the interventions put in place and also addressing some of the concerns that people had so in re you know obviously in relation to food if people have an issue with the timeliness of food and the quality of food I'm sure that would be you know reviewed in the part of that process but um, mm. I'm certainly not in that sort of process to give any sort of clarity about when that's taken place or how that'll take place. But I can sure. assure you that the department is reviewing our processes and continually trying to address these issues. So as an example, with the pharmacotherapy that happened in the tower, while we're dealing with North Melbourne and uh, Flemington, we're also looking at the other towers um, trying to get on the front foot of doing audits of who were the clients in there by contacting all chemists and the like, which is a huge task. But we learned while we were sort of dealing with Flemington, we were working behind the scenes to progress forward. Um, and I think that's some of the learnings as well. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Yes, I, I know it's not your your particular area. Um, so thanks for for um, for responding in in um, uh, it, Regardless, um, Abdi, there is a there's a question in the in the chat about um, anyone uh, who was living in the towers um, recruited to assist in translation and communication and advocacy. And I know that Liana, you were talking about um, making sure that there was translation of materials and and communication. Steph, um, you've mentioned it either here or elsewhere. I can't remember now which which conversation we've had about this. Abdi, what was your experience? Um, could you give us some shed some light on on that particular topic yeah so like with the communication like there weren't a lot of like communication was happening because most people just didn't know exactly what was happening like it was straight away people getting like in lockdown so a lot of people were confused we had time people had time no one really get angry it was just immediately locked out some people that they had no food in their house they got kids even though some people, they, they received what they wanted, it took time to, for them to get what they wanted, actually. And mm. that's the only thing people were angry about. So, but if we had time, 
wouldn't be perfect. And a lot of stuff, well, like what the Premier said about the funding, or if you, there's a lot of people that work, even nurses that are leaving the house, and people that go work and they look after children, family daycare. That's how they pay their rent. That's how they pay for their petrol, their grocery, everything. So a lot of people didn't receive no, no funds, exactly what the Premier said. About that 1,500 and that free rent. Like even my brother, he lives here, he didn't receive none of that. And every time he calls, they're like, oh, it's too late. There was a lot of things that didn't work out. A lot of people don't know, some people don't know English. So they don't know what's going on. Yeah. There's no one, they're like, what's, what's happening? It's old adults that live there. And no one explained to them. There's, there were no interpreter. They didn't talk about some, some old people would just come knock on your door and be like, hey, what's going on? And you, you don't know how to speak to them, but they speak different. Some people speak Japanese. Some people like, I, I, I speak Somali. I don't know, Eritrean. So it's hard to find someone that to speak, like to get them to know what's going on, that they cannot go downstairs. Like one of, one of these ladies, she's my neighbor, she's like around 74. I didn't know how to explain to her. She speak Arabic and obviously I have, I have to go to another house to find someone that speaks Arabic. And I'm like, no, nah, I can't leave. Because sometimes there's officers going up, up and down the staircase. So I'll get in trouble if they see me out of my house. And she knocked, I would like to, so I had to find a way to tell her, you know, you have to go back inside the house, what's going on. And we have to, my sister and I had to make food for her to provide meal for her. So it was quite hard. So, yeah. It sounded like an, it sounds like an extraordinary experience. Um, Abdi, maybe this is a good time to ask as well about um, the makeup of, of the people in the towers, the number of cultures and communities that, that um, make up those 3,000 odd people um, that live in the, across those nine tower blocks. Can you give us any insight into, um, into the, the, um, to the cultural groups that, that this would have impacted? Somali, Ethiopians, Oromo, there's Japanese, there's Sudanese, and the, that's the one, the one I really know is, I think there's Arabic and for some people West African, they live around the North Melbourne area. I don't know quite from Flemington people. I know a lot of Flemington people, I've got family members that live there, yeah. from especially 33 yeah. Alfred Street. There's more like a Sudanese, like more, more African side backgrounds that mm -hmm. were there. And a lot of people, the other thing was a lot of Ethiopians, they didn't eat halal food, some of them. That was the another thing. So some people, they were like, oh, hal yeah, we've got halal food. Some people say, you know, we can't, we don't eat this. So a lot of people forgot what other people eat and respect their religious. So there's a lot of like communication that people didn't talk about it. But it's for everybody, it's a lesson to learn for us, in which a lot of people, like even people I knew actually moved out from the towers. So they don't want to ever go through what happened again what happened to them. So a lot of people actually moved out from that that experience. They're like, we don't want to experience this again. So it's yeah. quite sad. Mm -hmm. And a lot of communities didn't get support because some some people, the communities actually didn't come and support them. Like us Somalis, they got a lot of people came to support us. We had the mosque right here to support the local, but the mosque supported everybody. But there's a lot of people in different backgrounds that I think didn't get real support. And like especially the HK facility in Melrose. I don't know, there's older people that live there, and especially in, in Pam Street, in next, in next to Kenning Street. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people there. I don't think they have received enough support, more than obviously us, even though we receive from support. I don't, people, some people forgot about the older people. That's what I was thinking about. Even now, since I work for Co Health, I'm health, health concierge, I work under the building, towers. I'm just like, sometimes I just have to engage with them, speak to them, oh, they ask me, oh, we in the lockdown too? I'm like, yeah, like, you know, we didn't get enough support. I couldn't see my daughter. I couldn't see my son. Some of them don't even have phones. That's the thing. And some, some of them, when their HK company come visit them, they couldn't visit them too, but they weren't allowed in the building. So it was quite hard for them. Like yesterday we had an incident. One of the elderly people, she fell off the chair and her leg broke. And obviously I couldn't hear it because it's all the way far. Because we sit downstairs. So someone actually called us for to help them. So like those kind of incident, her oven was on and it was burning. Imagine when she was waiting for an hour, things would have went worse. So yeah. there's a lot of things that yeah. have to be fixed even now, for especially the elderly people, you know, just like the youth or us. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Abdi. Um, Steph, I know that you were uh, for almost the entire two weeks um, on the ground trying to um, work with um, CoHealth and Liana's team to, uh, and, and um, in your role at Harm Reduction Vic, trying to support people um, ostensibly um, with any AOD needs, but it turned into something much broader than that, as I understand it. Do you want to share any insights from your perspective? Um, I was actually on, on the ground for the Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday and then uh, working from the office, more administrative support. Um, I noticed day by day the situation evolved. Um, yeah, so I, I'm curious about what was happening on that first Saturday because the, the, the first services there were um, the police. Uh, we were on site, Harm Reduction Victoria, um, supporting uh, co-health uh, uh, from Monday. We were able to access, I went into the Alfred Street um, community flats on the Tuesday afternoon, and that was uh, two nurses, two police officers and myself, and we were doing... Um, essentially, it started as doing a screening to see if anyone did need any... AOD specific needs, like do they need um, NSP equipment? Are they on pharmacotherapy? But it did become a very general um, welfare check. Uh, so yeah, if someone, if you didn't get someone knocking on your door or there was a delay, screening for things like, do you need a script filled? Um, yeah, that that those needs just might not be met. Uh, they, they, you might have this amazing capacity to access um, your scripts like on the ground because there was a pop-up pharmacy, but you needed to be to know that you could call a certain number. You needed to, to be able to speak to, to someone who spoke your language um, and you needed to yeah feel empowered, like you had the right to get all the health services that everyone else in the community has access to. Um, so yeah, my experience was it very much, yeah, it was all about ad adapting to whatever the needs uh, you could see in front of you were and um yeah there was a lot of negotiating um depending on the specific scenario yeah yeah thanks steph um thank you for your insights and and actually the um, the point that you make about the the first 48 hours is something that dave um, from Dave Taylor from VADA has also put into the Q&A and leads into the um, final question because I can't believe that we're almost out of time but the final question that I want to ask each of the panellists and um, Leanna I'll start with you again. Um, what do you think we've learned from this and, and what can we do going forward? Um, this, as, as we mentioned before this is unlikely to be um, the last time that something like the, uh, such a response is is going to be required. So what should we do next time? So as I was talking before, I think that prevention is better than cure. Kind of what Gary was saying is, you know, we've now got a, a much better kind of preventative response um, in um, public housing and vulnerable housing. So, you know, like Abdi is a health concierge, we're doing audits, um, we're providing hand sanitizer and masks and information in people's languages. So that's, I think, really important that um, that we communicate kind of the, the community transmission of information rather than, you know, the community are uh, the transmission of the virus. So um, I think that we've learned that, like, um, a partnership, so a community health has really good partnerships within the community and these were um, brokered really successfully, I think, and they're really important um, when we need to respond in this quick way that... The learnings I think we scaled up really quickly were we were able to provide safe services in, in such a short period of time. I think the learnings, um, and I remember this um, on the ground at the time, that the community was so supportive of each other. You know, the, you know these um, like high-rise towers of communities and they, they were, you know, we, I was knocking on people's doors and they were saying, can you check on the person two doors down because you know, I haven't heard from them. So that was that kind of, community intelligence was really important. Um, mm. our, um, ah, and then I think, yeah, I think just um, what Steph was talking about, and I guess that's my kind of reflection from today is that, you know, we, we were providing on the ground services, you know, we were doing our best with providing food and, you know, access, but 
Um, maybe the thing that we should, really should have done is um, that more assertive, you know, we, we do door knock, you know, I think over two days and we did make sure that we knocked on people's doors, but, you know, not everyone did answer the door and maybe we just needed to go around again, you know, you know, regularly over the time versus just once, once or twice at the start. Mm. Thanks, Leanna. Um, Gary, to you, learnings, what, what can we do differently next time? Hopefully there's not a next time. Um, and I do note that um, in other towers, um, subsequent to this, there's been different approaches that have been made. So I think there's already been learnings um, and hopefully we'll continue. Um, some of the learnings are probably, with the public health order, to be honest, on the Saturday, it was probably more of a um, control and command structure, which policing probably had the initial sort of driver. And I guess it took a few, a bit of time to try and, and get the help, more health response and sort of gear up the health response. Um, so probably um, in hindsight, maybe trying to get that health response in there at the start um, may have blunted the sort of response if you, for, yeah, for a better word. Um, so I think that's probably one of the things I'd look at. Um, the other one is obviously listening to people on the ground. You know, this is really a place-based sort of experience. Um, so I think there's a lot of narrative coming from people who are on the ground because that's where the experience is from a lived experience um, and what people went through um, so that those lessons can be learned. Um, also from, you know, people like CoHealth, um, Harm Reduction Victoria, um, the outreach workers working in there, how that had approached that next time. And the difficulty, you know, it's a really difficult one with care and control and trying to get that balance right. And I think, you know, we can always work on those sort of aspects. Right. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. And it, it also, um, you've just touched on on something, uh, on a, a question that Vanessa had in the in the chat about um, why people who lived in the towers weren't invited to be involved with the response. And um, you're, you're talking about more community engagement in, in that space. Perhaps that is something that um, we can also learn um, from from next time, uh, for next time, if there, yes, exactly, touch wood, hopefully there isn't, but certainly um, maybe it won't be as in, in such a profound way and might not even be related to the pandemic, but but certainly these things can and, can and do happen in all sorts of ways. So thank you so much, Leanna. Um, I wondered if you wanted to um, just touch on Gary's comments in relation to co-health. Yeah, so we, um, I think that was another frustration a little bit on the ground at the time is that some of the community leaders were um, impacted and were part of the lockdown. So it was um, frustrating that some of the our usual um, contacts in terms of the community leadership were, we weren't able to really assist us in the way that they'd really wanted to and the way that we would have loved to engage with them. So, however, we did, um, we were able to coordinate some um, things uh, on the phone uh, with them. Uh, we um, we are now, I guess that was part of the learnings is we are now um, using um, residents um, like Abdi, you know, as health concierges, we are uh, engaging the community in, um, uh, we've done um, um, community sessions where we've talked to community groups about what they really need, what they can identify as the areas we need to work with them on. So we're doing much more of that now. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Leanna, and thank, um, thank you for taking the question. Um, Steph, Abdi, I'm going to give the last word to you. So Steph, um, you're, the, you're the, uh, the next person. Um, what can we learn and what might we do differently next time? Um, thank you. I'd like to echo what Gary was saying about um, prioritizing health, like in in um, any <clears throat> any emergency response plans, making sure that we're prioritizing health um, in the terms of creation of emergency plans uh, involve the key affected community, like always affect the key affected community members, um, because then you're more likely to operational operationalize the plan well. Um, and another thing that I think that we should learn from this is uh, that uh, separation of powers is one of the most uh, fundamental 
uh, principles to um, uh, liberal democracy and separation of powers is ensured by mechanisms such as accountability mechanisms. And we do live in a state where we cannot criticize the police or make complaints about the police to anybody other than the police unless it's very serious uh, and it goes to IBAC. So this is something where there are um, inquiries happening at the moment that are relevant to this, but if anyone um, has the opportunity to look into it, I, I recommend that you do look into um, like the lacking element of accountability of Victoria Police. Thanks, Steph. And Abdi, the last word is over to you. Yeah, just for next time, hopefully it doesn't happen again, just for like communication, okay? There's a long, people are they're communicating with residents and everything, that's the main thing. We just wanna be communicating, you know, people and just know what's gonna be happening, what's going on, that's all I could say. It's a beautiful point to end on. Thanks so much, Abdi. Um, I would like to thank all of our panel members, um, Steph Janidis, Leanna Hellquist, Gary Morris, Abdi Ismail, and also our panel members from earlier, Michael Savage from Turning Point, Editor Kennedy, um, Mark Powell, Siona Crawford. Um, uh, I'm missing somebody. Who am I missing? Editor. Beth Loki. Thank you, Beth Loki, of course. <laughs> How could I? How could I forget? Um, sorry, Beth. Uh, and also um, Vada Scott Drummond and um, Julia Daly, thank you so much for your help um, in setting this up in the background. They've been extraordinary um, in, in the, uh, the organising of this extraordinary um, event for the third of the webinar series. There's one more to come. Uh, and uh, so please look out in Bartery, in Bartery News. Um, there is, it, um, Julia's just put into the, the chat the, um, the next one, next webinar for, for childhood trauma AOD and treatment. And, um, and I look forward to seeing you all there. Many thanks, everybody. Have a fabulous rest of your afternoon.